Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English. And we turn now in our study of the Odyssey to book 21, Odysseus Strings His Bow. Think about the fact that this, in many ways, the Odyssey has been a poem about tests. And now we have the great test. Think about this. This will be the book where Odysseus strings his bow. It'll be a great test for the suitors because they can't do it. It'll be a test for Telemachus because he can't do it, but then he almost does. It'll obviously be a test for Penelope because... If somebody actually does this other than Odysseus, and she doesn't know that that, blind, or that old beggar is, is Odysseus, um, then it will be a situation where she has to marry somebody that she doesn't want to marry. And obviously for Odysseus, it's a major test. Now, if you haven't been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, then I recommend that you do that. Let's cover our territory really quickly, books 1 through 20. Book 1, the invocation of the muse, and of course Telemachus is told it's time for you to grow up by Athena at line 341 in the, book, in the first book. Book 2, we have Telemachus, who will ultimately leave to go in search of his father information. In book 3, he's with Nestor. In book 4, he's with Menelaus and Helen. In book 5, we begin to see Odysseus on the island of Calypso. He leaves. He's shipwrecked. He ends up on the island of the Phaeacians. In book 6, he's with Nausicaa. In book 7, he's with the Phaeacians as a supplicant, and then finally in book 8 they have those games, the Phaeacian games, and Demodocus, the blind poet, and ultimately the question is, who are you? And Odysseus then in books 9, 10, 11, and 12 will tell the story of where he's been in those famous flashback books. In book 9 we have the story of Polyphemus, in book 10 we, uh, he ends up um, on uh, the island of Circe, in book 11 down into the underworld he goes, the house of the dead, and book 12 Finally, he will end up sailing between Scylla and Charybdis. They eat the forbidden cattle of the sun god. And then finally, the Phaeacians are ready to return him in book 13. In book 14, he ends up with Eumaeus, the swineherd. In book 15, we then jump back to Telemachus with Menelaus and Helen. Home he goes. Book 16, Odysseus and Telemachus are reunited. In book 17, Odysseus, as the old man, ends up at the palace. Remember, Argos dies. That's a tragic story. In book 18, we'll have the boxing match or the wrestling match between Odysseus and, and Iris, and he will end up jacking him. In book 19, um, Odysseus and Telemachus will hide the weapons, and Odysseus then will have his conversation with Penelope. In book 20, we begin the longest day that will culminate at the conclusion of book 22. Um, and, of course, we have all the missed signs um, that ultimately Theoclaminius will say, to the suitors, you guys are all jacked. Now the hope again is that you're reading this information on your own and using me. Our learning theory again is to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways in our reading at, at level one, um, summarizing at level two, at 2A themes messages at 2B. We're spending our time with symbol and irony and then finally at level 3, we're relating this information at 3A to other texts starting with the Iliad. Think about this, in book 21 You'll remember that Achilles does this amazing feat of strength by fighting against the river. And here in book 21, we'll see an amazing feat of strength in the stringing of the bow while he's sitting down nonetheless. Finally, at 3B, we'll ask, how can I relate to this information in some kind of personal way? Okay, let's summarize real quickly book 21 before we get to the lines. Penelope, she will go and get the bow. She will find it first. Then she will set it up in front of the suitors what the test will be. Telemachus will try and almost does it on his fourth attempt, but Odysseus will tell him, don't do it through a nod, okay? Uh, it, it ruins all the plans if Telemachus actually strings the bow, because we get that bow into Odysseus' hands, right? The cedars all try. They cannot. It's interesting that the only one who actually in the book, uh, 21, does not actually try is Alcinous. And, um, and, um, um, and, and, and he will say, you know... Um, uh, and, and, and Tenuous will say, uh, I, 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 I think this is a better thing for us to wait on. Odysseus then will have a very brief moment with Eumaeus and Philetius, the uh, cow herd and the swine herd, um, and he will in fact give us one of those recognition scenes. He will say, I'm Odysseus and I'm back. And Tenuous then will say, you know what, let's not do this today because it's Apollo's, Apollo's feast day. Let's just mess around with this tomorrow. Odysseus says, how about me? Let me string the bow. And Tenuous immediately says, yeah, no way. Penelope says, why don't you guys let him do it? Telemachus will then say to his mother, mom, why don't you let men be men? You go back up to your room and, and, and keep to your weaving. And the idea will be, obviously, she needs to for sure be out of this hall when book 22 begins. And, and we have the, the major jack scene towards the uh, suitors. Eumaeus will take the bow to Odysseus 
And there he is, first of all, studying the bow as the suitors will jeer at him, stringing the bow as he sits down, shooting through all 12 axe heads. We'll have a bit to say about exactly what that even means. And finally, at line 479, he stands up and he will say it, Telemachus, the hour has come. And then we have the real Jack C. Now, I'm going to say this at the end of this lecture. Remember, the books that we divide the Odyssey up into are arbitrary. There is no actual break at all. And so when the poet was reciting this poem and got to the end of book 21, it's not like he paused and then went on to book 22. He just nice and seamlessly went into book 22. And certainly that's going to be an important uh, re uh, realization for us as well. Now, as I've said about all these books, it's so much fun to read this stuff out loud. And no question, book 21 is one of those really fun books to read out loud. We begin by making the observation that great feats of strength are often what are going to define the epic hero. And at line 475, that will be the question for Odysseus. Am I still strong enough? And then he'll say it at 475, my strength's not broken yet. The other thing I want you to write down about this book, book 21, is that really I think this is the most ironic book of all of the books. I've told you through our lectures that the irony just continues to build. This has to be one of the darkest ironic books of uh, the, the, uh, the Odyssey, and I would say of almost any literature. Um, and finally, at line uh, 448, we're even going to hear that he twists and turns the bow as he's looking at it, which will take us back to the opening lines of the poem. The opening lines of the poem, the time had come, we would say probably finally, right? The goddess Athena, with her blazing eyes, inspired Penelope, wary, poised, to set the bow and the gleaming iron axes out before her suitors waiting in Odysseus's hall to test their skill and bring their slaughter on. She goes to the chamber. She finds uh, the bow, his back-sprung bow with its qu uh, quiver, bristling arrows, shafts of pain. And then we get a brief history of the bow. It ultimately, in some renderings, actually might come from Apollo himself, which makes this even more remarkable. It was a gift of Telemachus. Hercules is even mentioned at line 28. Um, as being a part of the story of the way that Odysseus comes to this bow. Ultimately, it came to him through an exchange of weapons, and we're told that the great weapon at line 45, Odysseus didn't even take with him to Troy. He kept it stored, guarding the memory of a cherished friend, and only took the bow on hunts at home. So now all of a sudden it's going to end up in his hands. Then uh, we have the inserting of the, uh, of, of the key to actually go and get the bow itself for, uh, for Penelope. Uh, there's so much beautiful things here. By the way, um, you have your Fagel's translation. There's this really fun uh, passage in James Joyce's Ulysses that's talked about on page 515 of your Fagel's translation about the whole thing of the inserting of the key and the turning of the key to open the door that gets her ultimately Penelope to this bow. But there's this, all these amazing little eyes for detail. For example, just read it with me in line 61. Reaching, tiptoe, she's got to reach up to get where the bow is. Lifting the bow down off its peg, still secure in the burnished cage that held it. By the way, let's point out that this hanging on a peg will remind us that Demodocus is um, uh, liar, real remember, hangs on a peg behind him during the Phaeacians' uh, exchanges. On his peg, still secure in the burnished case that held it, down she sank, laying the case across her knees and dissolved in tears with a high thin wail as she drew her husband's weapon from its sheath. The question has always been, why is she crying? If she knows that Odysseus is in fact the, the beggar, she knows that what she's doing is basically potentially sending her husband to his death. How is he going to kill 118 guys with just a bow and arrow set? If she doesn't know that Odysseus is the beggar, think about this, then what she's doing is setting up the contest that ultimately could lead to her having to marry some of these one of these disgusting suitors, right? Either way, she has reason to cry. She sobs. She then will uh, take, the, um, take the, the bow downstairs, and she's ready to speak to the suitors at line 78. Listen to, my, listen to me, my overbearing friend, she says. You who plague this palace night and day, drinking, eating us out of house and home, with the Lord and Master absent, gone so long, the only excuse that you can offer is your zest to win me as your bride. So, she says, to arms, my gowns. <laughs> and this is a really interesting Iliad uh, language, right? Here is the prize at issue right before you. Of course, she is the prize, right? Look, I set before you the great bow of... King Oedipus now. In other words, oh no, I'm not the prize, the bow is the prize. Well, the hand that string the hand that can string this bow with greatest ease, that shoots an arrow clean through all twelve axes, he is the man I will follow, yes, forsaking this house, 
where I once was a bride, this gracious house so filled with the best that life can offer. I shall remember it, that I know, even in my dreams. Now, there is sometimes this question about what exactly is the contest? Scholars have provided at least two answers. By the way, the non-answer is, no, the contest is not about shooting an arrow through the actual iron of 12 axes and then making a target. No, 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 no. That, that would make this a mythic kind of contest. No. Instead, there's two views, and it has to do with two different ends of the axe. If it's a double-bladed axe and there's some kind of area between the actual wood that holds the blades and the blades themselves, some kind of a hole there or something, if those are lined up, then we're shooting them through the axe heads, the holes that are, that are associated. The other option, and many scholars feel this is the better one, is that there must be some kind of loop or something at the bottom of the, at the, at the handle of the axe. And so you bury the axe head in the ground, and you line up these little loops. And so what's happening is we're shooting twelve uh, uh, through tw uh, we're shooting an arrow through twelve of these loops at the end of the handle. Fagels will seem to play more that game by using the, the term handle when he talks about it. Penelope then will turn to Eumaeus as well as to Philetus and say, "I need you to set this up." We're told that they both start weeping, and Antinous will wheel on both of them and ridicule them. Yokels, fools, you can't tell night from day, you mawkish idiots. Why are you sniveling here? You're stirring up your mistress. Isn't she drowned in grief already? She's lost her darling husband. Sit down, eat in peace, or take your, snuff, uh, your snuffling out of doors. But leave the bow right here, our crucial test that makes or breaks us all. The ironies every time Antinous speaks in this book is, are just dark. No easy game, I wager, to string his polished bow. Not a soul in the crowd can match Odysseus. What a man he was, right? <laughs> well, yeah, we're about to find out. Antinous was about to find out what a man he was. I saw him once, remember him to this day, though I was young and foolish way back then. Two observations for your notes. The fact that Antinous says he was young and foolish back then is only going to heighten the irony. He obviously is still young and foolish. But the other thing is, let's say this out loud. When Odysseus left 20 years ago, most of these suitors were young children. Like Telemachus, they were either children or infants. So neither the suitors nor Telemachus have actually ever seen Odysseus and certainly seen him in action. To that degree, what we're about to witness with this feat of strength of Odysseus, they are not prepared for at all. It's going to blow them out of the water. In some ways, the, the poet will tell us, Antinous was fated to be the first man to taste an arrow whip from the great Odysseus's hands. We're, we're going to see that in the opening lines of Book 22. And then Telemachus will laugh, and he will say, Zeus up there, line 118, has robbed me of my wits. My own dear mother, sensible as she is, says she'll marry again, forsake our house, and look at me laughing for all I'm worth, giggling like some fool. Step up, my friends, and he will, in, he will continue at line 128. Um, Why sing my mother's praises, he says. Come, let the games begin. By the way, we heard this exact same language by Achilles in Iliad uh, 23, and as well in Odyssey 8, 140, this let the games begin thing, which is of course what we say obviously for the Olympics. No dodges, no delays, no turning back from the stringing of the bow. We'll see who wins, we will. I'd even take a crack at the bow myself. If I string it and shoot through all the axes, I'd worry less if my noble mother left our house with another man and left me here behind. Man enough at last to win my father's splendid prizes. In other words, for Telemachus, we're going to continue to see this coming of age story. The buildings rum in is the term we used in the Telemache of the first four books. In other words, he says, I think I'm going to go ahead and try and try. He does. He will give it a shot, right? Um, first, though, he plants the axes, digging a long trench for one and all, and trued them all to a line. Wonder took the revelers looking on, his work so firm and precise, though he'd never seen the axes ranged before. He stood at the threshold, poised to try the bow. Three times he made it shudder, straining to bend it. Three times its power flagged. Now, by the way, just because some of you hunt with uh, compound bows, let's make sure we understand. We're talking about what we out here call recurve bow. In other words, when the bow is sitting there, it's just a straight piece of wood. You have to actually bend the wood. You have to put the string up and around the top of the notch. And then you have a bow that can, in fact, shoot a uh, fletch and shoot an arrow. So bending this bow is going to be really difficult to do. And Telemachus tries. At the fourth time, we're told, Odysseus shook his head and stopped him short despite his, uh, his uh, uh, tensing zeal. Right at the moment when Telemachus probably will be able to string this bow, Odysseus gives him a look like, yeah, I don't want you to do it. And then Telemachus will say, God, help me, the inspired prince cried out at line 150. Must I be a weakling, a failure? 
all my life. Now at this point we realize that Telemachus is really playing a role. That is to say, he's letting the men know that he thinks that he is a weakling, right? And unless I'm too young to trust my hands to fight off any man who rises up against me, all of this will be ironic given what Telemachus is going to do beside his father in book 22. Definitely going to jack himself some suitors, no question. Come, my better, so much stronger than I am, try the bow and finish off the contest. Well, they all try, but the first one to try is Leodes. Now, Leodes is interesting because he is, in fact, the priest that we began our lectures with, that Odysseus will jack in 22, line 336 and following. And then right afterwards, Odysseus will save the life of the poet Bard. All right, This is our Leodes, and Leodes tries, and he can't do it, so he says at line 171, friends, I can't bend it. Take it, your son, take it someone, try. Here is a bow, but note the irony. He's a seer, so he sees the future. And we are told that Leodes is, in fact, of all the suitors, Probably the one that's the nicest, that's the one that, it doesn't matter, or just he's going to jack them all anyway, but he says, here is a bow to rob our best of life and breath, all our best contenders still, better be dead than live on here, never winning the prize that tempts us all forever in pursuit, burning with expectation every day. And Tenuous will taunt Leodes. He says, what are you saying at line 191? What's got past your lips? What grisly uh, nonsense? It shocks me to hear it. Here is a bow to rob our best of life and breath. Just because you can't string it, you're so weak. Clearly, you, your genteel mother never bred her boy for the work of bending bows and shooting arrows. By the way, Leodes' hands, because they're so soft, and, are, are, are uh, torched by trying to bend the, uh, the, the bow. Antinous continues, though. We have champions in our ranks to string it quickly. Hop to it, Melentheus. You, you think what he's about to say is Melentheus string the bow, but instead, he barked at the goat herd. Rake the fire in the hall, pull up a big stool, heap it with fleece, and fetch that hefty bowl of lard from the stores inside so we young lords can heat and limber the bow and rub it down with grease before we try it again and finish off the contest. In other words, let's put the bow in the fire, let's warm it up so that it's easier to bend. Note the dark irony here. We're going to go ahead and prepare the weapon that will ultimately kill so many of them, beginning, of course, with the speaker in Tenuous, right? So none of them can string the bow. Eumaeus and, um, and, um, and uh, uh, Philotetus, the, well, while they're trying to string the bow, will sneak out. And we have this very interesting exchange starting at line 220 between Odysseus and the two men. He says, how far would you go to fight beside Odysseus? Say he dropped out like that from a clear blue sky and a god brought him back. Would you fight for the suitors or for your king? Tell me how you feel inside your hearts. And Philotetus is the first one to say, uh, you'd see my power, my fighting arms in action. In other words, I'm totally for you. You may as too. And it's at this point that Odysseus will reassure them quickly, I'm right here at line 235. I'm right here, here in the flesh, myself, and home at last after 20 years of brutal hardship. Now, I know that all my men, out of all my men, you two alone long for my return. From the rest, I've heard not one real prayer that I, that I come back again. So, now I'll tell you what's in store for you. And then he promises them teammate, as we've used this term many times. Scooby Snacks. If a god beats down the lofty suitors at my hands, I'll find you wives, both of you, grant you property. Remember, these guys are slaves, which means they've got no property and no potentiality of it. Sturdy houses beside my own, and in my eyes you'll be the comrades to Prince Telemachus' brothers from then on. Come, I'll show you something. Living proof. Now, uh, know me for certain. Put your minds at rest. This scar. Look where the boar's white tusk gored me years ago, hunting on Parnassus. So in other words, shows them the scar, they cry, Odysseus says no more weeping, and then he says, here's the sign, when good Eumaeus carries the weapon to me, then he says it's time. We'll have them caught in our huge net, Philetus, who we're told is going to lock the gate, Odysseus then will go back to his stool, and that's where he is, at his stool. When Eumaeus tries, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, Eurymachus tries, and he cannot string the bow. A black day, he exclaimed in Winded Pride, um, at line uh, 278. A blow to myself, a blow to each man here. It's less the marriage that mortifies me now that's galling too, but lots of women are left, some in uh, Seeger, Ithaca, some in other cities. What breaks my heart is the fact we fall so short of great Odysseus' strength, we cannot string his bow, a disgrace to ring in the ears of men to come. Eurymachus, Antinous will counter. And it's here the ironies will just mount, right? Um, by the way, no, Antinous never actually tries to string the bow. 
um, in, in, in this book, right? Today, he says, it's the feast day of archer god Apollo. Set it aside. Let's rest easy now. He says to the steward, pour some cups. Let's have some respect for the gods. Notice the irony. Now, all of a sudden, Antinous is ready to respect the gods. Of course, this is because he's hoping he can put off one more day this test. He says, let's just go ahead and, and, put, the, and put the bow to bed, which is kind of funny language. Um, uh, it's Odysseus who will speak next. And just a few lines before 310, Odysseus will say, listen to me, you lords. I have to say what the heart inside me urges. I appeal especially to Eurymachus and you, brilliant Antinous. We said this in the, in the Iliad. When you want to make fun of Paris, you, you, know, you use that term brilliant in front of him too. Who spoke so shrewdly now. Give the bow a rest for today. Leave it to the gods at dawn. The archer will grant a victory to the man he favors most. Dark ironies, right? For the moment, give me the polished bow, bow, polished bow now, won't you? So to amuse you all, I can try my hand. My strength is the old force still alive inside these gnarled limbs. Uh, this, is, this is interesting kind of question, right, as well. Or has a life of roaming, years of rough neglect, destroyed it long ago? Indignant rage, we're told. Um, for Antinous, fearing that he just might string the bow, and he calls him filthy drifter. He says, not content to feast at your ease with us and the, and, and, and the island's pride. Never denied your full share of the banquet. Of course, Antinous not only definitely denied him, but you'll remember, threw a stool at him. Uh, he says, you have been, we've allowed you to be here. You can listen in on our secrets. No one else can eavesdrop on our talk, and this is exactly what Odysseus has been doing. Um, and then uh, he says, you must be drunk. And then all of a sudden, Antinous will mention the famous story about the centaur who came to a wedding party and tried to sleep with her rape the bride. And for that, there was all kinds of fighting, etc., etc. And a feud was begun. Um, and, and in the end, he says, you too, I promise you, no end to trouble if you could string this bow, line 345 and, and following. You'll meet no kindness in our part of the world. We'll sail you back on a black ship um, uh, um, to, to um, Eutychus. And he says, don't take on the younger, stronger men. Let's put it in our notes. The Odyssey, has, it seems, and the Iliad. Homer clearly is very interested in the tension between younger men and older men. And what is 